Hello, Stitchers. Welcome to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork. I'm a fourth generation sewing enthusiast with more than 20 years of sewing experience. I am looking forward to today's conversation. So sit back, relax, and get ready to get your stitch together. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Stitch Please podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork, and we are talking today with Vanessa Martina of Cosido Studio, based in the Netherlands. I am so excited to have Vanessa on the program today. We're going to talk a bit about, of course, her sewing story, the work of Cosido Studios, her belief in, in, in pattern inclusion, as well as some, contra- not controversial, but as well as her opinions and our conversation about African can print fabrics in the Netherlands because that's where a lot of this started. So she is a black woman who is right there in the Netherlands with some very interesting opinions on the Dutch involvement in African print fabric. Vanessa, welcome to the program and thank you for being here. Thank you, Lisa, for having me. This is fantastic. Can you tell me, Vanessa, what is your sewing story? How did you get started sewing? So I started sewing quite young, actually. I got my first sewing machine when I was five. It was this hand wheel wooden machine. But sewing has always been around my family. The women in my family all could and were all sewing. And yeah, so that's where it started. I got some classes in primary school, too. And yeah, during my teens, I always sewed. And I decided to also start study dressmaking and product development later. And that's how I got started in fashion. That is fantastic. I'm going to ask you to tell me a little bit more about your hand wheel wooden sewing machine. Did you say wooden? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's made out of wood. Yeah, a the, sewing machine? Oh my goodness. The outside is made of, out of wood. And then there's this hand wheel thing. It used to work. It's not working anymore. I'm looking for someone to restore it. But yeah, it used to work. And then you turn the wheel and then you can sew with it. It's uh, That yeah. is incredible. I have never heard of a wooden <laughs> sewing machine before. See, we've we only we just started talking and I've already learned so much. So what it's also interesting because I think the Dutch aren't you all known for like wooden shoes in yeah. Holland? Those <laughs> yeah, little wooden true. shoes. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm like, wooden shoes, wooden sewing machine. <laughs> I, I really feel like I, my mind is actually being a bit blown right now. I had never thought about a wooden sewing machine. Thank you for bringing that into my life. So let's talk a bit about dress studying dressmaking. When you started to go into fashion, what does that require, the study of dressmaking? Yeah, it's more like bespoke dressmaking and tailoring. So you learn the bespoke how do you say? Like techniques? Yeah, or? The bes- the bes- it's more bespoke techniques, handmade techniques, and pattern drafting by hand and not by computer. And hmm. yeah, just for working with clients and that sort of thing. That is pretty exciting. The I, I, I always find pattern making to be intimidating. So the idea of learning to draft a pattern, not using computer software, but just using your computer, using, using, using skills of either the uh, tape measure and measurements and drawing just that way. That's very nice. So when you started Cosido Studio, what were some of your goals? What were some of the things you had in mind about building your own fashion brand? Well, I came from the fashion industry and I worked for a couple of brands and I felt like the size system and the the patterns we were drafting were not for people like me with my body type, the curvy body type. So I really wanted to start a, a brand, a pattern brand that served that market. And that yes. with curvy uh, uh, bust, uh, a booty, a sway back. 
Yes, that sounds like you're describing my actual body. I call it booty blessings. I've got some booty Absolutely blessings. I have a sway back that I often have to adjust for. So you were able to take these things and apply them to some of the lessons you had learned in fashion school. Was it a surprise to you that when you started studying that the designers or the models or the templates that people were using to create patterns were not reflective or that they were so narrow? Was that something that was surprising to you? Yeah, this, the whole industry serves as sort of a, a standard body shape, which is a Eurocentric body shape. And all the size charts and all the, the, the measurements we used were also geared to that. And some of the brands I worked for it was the same thing. The target market was not reflected to who I am, but we expected to make garments and make products for the, that Eurocentric body type. So I really wanted to start something that reflected my body type and body shape. And I also believe curvy is not only plus size. I believe curvy can be small and be curvy, which is something right. we as black women know. And that there's a way to think about curves. There's lots of there's lots of different curves. Yeah. There's lots of different types of curves on a human body. And I think it's interesting to me to when you go to if you're at a fashion school and you're studying that they're training you in just one narrow way to view the body. Which is interesting to me that so there's that there's no like prompts for just to say, OK, let's do this, but let's increase the bus size because there are people who actually have bus sizes larger than this no. or let's increase the waist size because people have waists that are larger than this size. These kind of things I find I find pretty surprising, but you were able to work around those or work through those. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's true that you were able to find your own vision? You're able to say, I am going to. I'm going to create this in a way that makes sense to me. Yeah, for me, that's really important because I bought patterns that didn't fit my body type. So I had to make a lot, lots of adjustments. And I felt you cannot serve everybody, but you should need to choose a body type you're serving so that, for, so that you can make solutions for people that otherwise couldn't find that particular pattern or size or and that's what I was trying to do I also when I worked in the industry we used to grade up to from a smaller size all the way up which of course you can make lots of mistake by doing that not just let me just let's just click and drag and make it bigger because no. someone might have a bigger bust and bigger hips and waist, but their shoulders aren't going to be that yeah. much bigger. Their head or neck is not going to be that much bigger. And so it really takes a type of deliberate work in order to create sizes that are going to be truly reflective yeah, it, of a variety of people. Exactly. And in the industry, because you want to make it ex as simple as possible because you're mass producing, so you don't want to have too much of a difference between sizes. So they simplify the, their size chart. And with doing that, they're excluding a lot of people. And that's something that I didn't believe in anymore. So I wanted to make a difference. I think that's such an important reminder that when you were training and working in the fashion industry, the patterns you made were going to be sent to manufacturers and people were going to manufacture these garments in large quantities. You weren't sending these patterns to individual no. hobbyists or individual sewists or people who just love to sew so that they could make one or two garments at home. You were sending them to places. How many would they make if you were like, I'm not sure. I don't understand. I don't think I understand the scale of what mass production is. Are they making hundreds? Are they making thousands? Thousands. We used to only fit one size. And then because we had a block and the grading was set, the responsibility of making the actual pat pattern was with the supplier overseas. Wow. And of course, a lot of supplies don't look like us. 
or even look mm-hmm. like European, these European brands. So right, and they right. were making a pattern and then they sent the garment back. So a lot of the responsibility of making the pattern for uh, mass produced products are with the suppliers. Not always with every uh, company, but especially with the sort of the fast fashion companies. That's yes. usually the rule, the responsibility for the patterns and are with the supplier and then they send back the samples and then we in the office used to fit those samples on fit models which were also always Euro- European <laughs> women <laughs> yeah European yeah. very yeah. lean people and so people fit the garments and then yeah it got graded and then it's, it gets into the stores and one of the companies I work for my uh, responsibility is was to make sure there was consistency between all those uh, suppliers mm. so that the brand in size had somewhat of a consistency because you had a factory in China or a factory in uh, Turkey. So and mm-hmm. they all had to look the same and have the same sort of fit. Yes. So, yeah. Even though they were coming from different places, exactly. the the brand, the company wanted to make sure that if this is a size yeah. 42, it's the size 42 for yeah. everybody, whether it's from the Turkish factory or from the factory in China. Yeah. It's, it, we just want to make sure this is all the same. And so you're saying they weren't really thinking very much about even being able to reach a variety of consumers with different body types. No. It was just about selling as much as possible, as quickly as possible. Exactly. And of course, you have, we have also in the industry the problem of vanity sizing. And of, yes, yeah. yes. So that also uh, plays a big part in the confusion between sizes, between different uh, brands. But, yes, that's um, true. That's so true. Yeah. That one brand size 12 is yeah. another brand size 16 is another brand size yeah. 8. Like it's really hard to trust the numbers. Yeah. Because uh, they're not consistent. No, and the reason why the there's so much consistency is because they use the, the size label as a sort of a, a marketing tool. So when a, a size is labeled smaller, that increases sales. Yeah, that is so yeah, interesting. We're such emotional buyers. So if we think we're a size smaller, that increases the sales of the product. And also it's to exclude, it used to be to exclude people. Because if you're a younger brand, you don't want to size all the way up to plus size so that you were focused on a, yeah, a younger consumer. It's like it's yeah. a younger consumer. Yeah. And it's also reinforcing a lot of these negative ideas that if you are a younger consumer, you don't have a curvy body. Exactly. Because, which makes no sense. What's so funny about the vanity size and something I have been thinking a lot about, Vanessa. Yeah. Um, if you buy underwear in the store, at least here in the States, if I want to buy, which I don't do often since I sew a lot of, I sew pretty much everything. I sew my husband's and my kids' underwear. I sew wow. all of it. But when I was buying it, do you know how hard it is to find a pair of men's briefs sized small? Yeah, for men's it works the other way around. Then smaller instead of smaller. Isn't that so weird? It is absolutely that, weird. I do find it. I think it's of course it's about patriarch, it's about power, it's about men wanting to feel bigger yeah. and, and women want to scarily feel women wanting to be smaller yeah. like and also different regions have different uh, sizes. So there's a difference. So if there's a global brand, but they're sending the products all over the world, but they're mm-hmm. still uh, focusing on that Eurocentric body standard. Yeah, that mm-hmm. also creates a lot of uh, confusion. Yes, Yes, I could definitely understand that because, you know, that, that it's also because, and that goes back to, as you say, we are emotional buyers. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if you think sewing for yourself is, a, is also, does it have that same kind of emotional weight? 
like I think for me, it, it, you described a situation that I've had before, like getting a pattern, a commercial pattern, and it's okay. I really like this. I know it's going to fit in the shoulders and bust, but I'm going to have to make adjustments at the hip and the center back because it's not going to look right. And I think one way to think about it is that, oh, the pattern is too narrow. The pattern is not designed for me. The pattern is the flaw. But there are also some people who would take the opposite effect and say, oh, no, I need to be the same size as this block that Mm -hmm. this company made and then start to feel negatively about themselves. And so I was just wondering if you feel as though that you had an opportunity in creating your own patterns to really make people feel included? Well, I made my own size chart with my own descriptions of the sizing. So I basically Mm. uh, have a size group A, a group B, and a group C. And within those groups, I uh, have one block, and I grade two times, uh, two sizes down and two, two sizes up. So I don't grade from a small size all the way up. And because I have my own sort of description of the size, I don't really, yeah, it's the standard names of sizes don't mean that much anymore for me. Yeah, because I just took that the names out of it or the numbers, the numbers were so emotional about the numbers. I took the numbers yes. out of it and I tried to make my patterns as easy as possible for people to adjust at home to their needs if they but I still focus on that curvy body shape and try to make solutions I, for that. I think that's great. I noticed that in your size chart that you had letters. So I'm glad to hear yeah. you explain that because I was like, wait, I don't see what the number. Yeah, no, I think that's I, I think that's wonderful because what you've done is to say I and also how you say you started it on your own body and thinking about what is going to work for me will also work for a lot of people. And it'll importantly work for a lot of people who are unrecognized by the standard industry. Yeah. That we know that there's a set of people who are not being spoken to and that you can step in and speak to them. So I think that's really very powerful. We're going to take a quick break. Mm -hmm. And when we come back, we're going to talk more about her pattern. We'll talk about the Lena pattern. I want to hear more about that, as well as a bit more about what the sewing scene in the Netherlands is like for Vanessa. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Stitch Please podcast is really growing. I want to thank you for listening to the podcast and ask a favor. If you are listening to this podcast on a medium that allows you to rate it or review it, for example, Apple Podcasts or iTunes, please do so. If you're enjoying the podcast, if you could drop me a five-star rating, if you um, have something to say about the podcast um, and you wanted to include that, a couple sentences in the review box of Apple makes a really big difference in how the podcast is evaluated by Apple, how it becomes more visible. It really is a way to lean into the algorithm that helps to rank podcasts. So if you had time to do that, to drop a little line in the review feature of the podcast, that would be really appreciated and it would help us to grow even further and faster. Welcome back, everybody. And this is Lisa. I'm the, your host of the Stitch Please podcast. And we're talking today with Vanessa Martina of Cosido Studio based in the Netherlands. Um, and we were just talking uh, before the break about size inclusivity and how important it is. And Vanessa, can you talk a bit about the two patterns you have out right now? I am looking right now at the Luna Peplum Top, which is so beautifully illustrated. I'm looking at the image of the black woman with the beautiful hair and the beautiful bright colors. Can you talk a bit about your inspiration behind creating this top, the the peplum top? Yeah, a a peplum top is always a classic for me. I love to wear a peplum top. It hits me in the right places. So I'm always, I always want a peplum in my wardrobe. For this one, I'm now working on making two additional busts sizes to add that to the pattern and I really wanted a a style that you can work with jeans or with a skirt or yeah dress up or dress down so that's my uh, inspiration behind it 
the illustrations I make myself. I just uh, last year I started to do illustrations and then I love doing fashion illustrations. So that's uh, what I always try to do in the collection as well. It's really quite lovely. And I love the cartoon drawing. I just, I'm really a fan of that type of style. I love that style. But I think you're also in here as well. Isn't this a picture of you modeling the peplum top? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> It's, it's true. so pretty. And so when you say, I'm looking at the large pictures as well as the small ones. And if you look at the thumbnail sizes, the small pictures, you can really see the silhouette of the peplum doing the work that you described, that it just, it hits you just right. I like peplums for that reason as well. Even though I have booty blessings and hips, I really think that I think maybe because of that, that peplums look really good on me. Yeah. I really like that. <laughs> and so it, I'm definitely getting that look from looking at the Luna peplum. But you have it on with some beautiful red heels and jeans, but it's very easy to imagine changing it up and doing a different doing a different look, a yeah. different bottom, doing sequins or something to make it. It can really go from night to day very quickly. And so I really mm. love that about the peplum top. So tell me about the Lima. Now, the Lima is more, it's a complete dress. Is that right? Yeah, a Lima is, a, that's the dress. Also with the princess seams. I like yes. princess seams because sometimes with a dart, because I have a large bust, it's too, like, pointing. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so I like. Uh, yes, yes. It's, it's just a nice silhouette to do a princess seam, and it's gathered at the waist. And then I have a maxi skirt and a, a shorter version. Uh, these are PDFs. Now I know how you feel about PDFs, Lisa, but <laughs> <laughs> I hope in the future to add some uh, printed pattern to my uh, line. <laughs> Yes. Look, I don't have to do all of the PDFs. I'm not going to say anything <laughs> bad about them. I know that my opinion on this has probably been pretty made, made pretty clear. It's not that I like PDF patterns. It's the taping. Oh, that's the, the taping. part that's hard for me. The taping. Oh my gosh. Well, that's the thing. What makes one of the advantages of PDFs is that you can select to print only your own size. And I yes. have also the seam allowance in a separate layer. And the actual oh, pattern. So if you need to do adjustments, you can just turn off the seam allowance so you can only work on the actual pattern. That is so smart, especially since so many folks have different seam allowances. I think the seam allowance for lots of folks in different, it seems like in Europe, that they like the three centimeter uh, seam allowance. One, yeah, I use usually usually one centimeters but the patterns we buy here the european patterns don't have cm allowance a lot of times so they have no seam no. allowances so, so you use a one cm yeah, yeah. seam allowance yeah. that's right it's because you in, uh, inches that's right one centimeter is three eighths yeah. and we use five eighths yeah and which is so interesting because some have argued that five eighths is far too big for a seam allowance and I know that some companies use a quarter inch, yeah. which is just a little bit smaller than the one centimeter. But the idea of having no seam allowances, I know that's true, right? Because I know that from some pattern magazines, yeah. you buy the pattern, you buy the or the pattern magazine, and you trace it off, and, you have to and then the you add yourself. your yeah. you you add it yourself. Yeah. Something that I did used to do. Now I did used to do when I was sewing yeah. from those magazines. I would find my colors and trace the lines onto pattern yeah. paper. And then I would put the pattern paper under the needle of the sewing machine and I would sew my oh, seam allowances. My just, yeah, I would just put like some dark thread and use a basting stitch oh, and just okay. sew, like put the left side of my presser foot next to the line mm -hmm. that I traced. And then that's the seam allowance I would sew for sewing the pattern because I had already sewn it once. And I found it much easier to do that than to maintain, at least for me, because I'm not a designer. I'm not trained as you are in pattern making. I had a hard time keeping a consistent drawing line at the proper distance between the stitch line and the seam allowance okay. or the stitch line and the cut line. I just kept, I would, I would, I kept messing it up and I kept trying to find different ways and taping two pencils together. And it just, I just couldn't figure it out until I stumbled upon this idea a long, a long time ago, but it was really helpful. It really did help me to maintain those, those seam yeah. allowances. I'm I used mm -hmm. to doing without seam allowance. That when I started my patterns, I didn't have seam allowance. And then my testers actually pointed out 
you need to have seam allowance on your pattern. So I added them, but I was so used to it. And also I uh, just cut it by hand, uh, one centimeter seam allowance. And I also have a, a magnet that you put on your scissors that you can I cut heard of that. Uh, one centimeter or whatever you need. Yes. Yeah. Now that I have heard of, I have heard of that. I have seen that in photos, but I have never, I saw that. I am so excited. You have the best toys. <laughs> you have, I just want to remind everybody, if you missed this in the last segment, she has a wooden sewing machine. <laughs> And now she's telling me that she has these special one centimeter tall magnets that she can attach to her scissors and not mark the seam allowances on any pattern, just cut. Yeah, straight away. That is very, yeah. very impressive. And I, I love it because it sounds like a really great time saver. <laughs> I'm always looking for a little yeah. shortcuts with sewing. Can we talk a bit about your illustrations? And I know you've mentioned before about how you started doing this illustrations. I am just loving these beautiful black women that are modeling these patterns. Can you say more about what kind of mood that establishes or what kind of story or brand identity or whatever that stat that establishes for you? Cause I think, I think they are so cute. Yeah. I've seen a lot of uh, fashion illustrations also on patterns and usually it's white women. And I really wanted to represent like myself on the patterns and also show off the clothes, but I'm that you can see a little bit how it's fitting and how it's looking and make a mood, a fashion mood around the patterns. Mm -hmm. And yes. give a, sort of like a magazine feel with the patterns, which makes it maybe also a bit more enjoyable to buy a sewing pattern. And yeah, I love ju just drawing and uh, drawing our hairstyles and yeah, yes. the whole mood and feel around it. It does. I think it does make it more enjoyable because at least for me, when I go to your page and I see these two images, I like, I want to, I smile. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're so pretty. They're yeah, so pretty. I feel like someone is really trying to speak to me as opposed to a, a lot, a lot of different companies where I don't see myself reflected or anyone that looks like me reflected. Mm -hmm. That's a choice too. And so I just think that the idea that you have made this choice to emphasize and address and speak to Black women is just really beautiful. I want to transition to talk a bit about life, not so much life, but I know we talked about, can, we talk, can you share any information about what the sewing scene is like for you in your community? Or if it's possible to talk about the Netherlands as a whole, what is the sewing, the, what is sewing like there for someone who is just a regular um, person that loves to, I know for us, I had this great experience when I talked with a woman, Choma, who lives in Nigeria. And she told me about her sewing scene, which was very different than mine here in the States. And I was curious about how that worked for you as well. Do you just go to the store and buy patterns and buy fabric or is, is there a market? Is there, are there lots of fabric stores? Are there very few? Are people interested in garment sewing or is it more of a different style of craft that people are doing there? Yeah, there's, in terms of stores, fabric stores, they're not so much anymore. And the sewing scene is also not that much. I noticed that because of the pandemic, a, a lot of people are starting to pick up sewing again. So it's beginning to uh, become more and more popular. There are a couple of good stores, which are here, which are quite old stores. But in terms of finding patterns, mm, no, not so much. I find most of my patterns online. That is, and, and I guess it's interesting to me that you that there's not that many patterns because it makes me wonder, at least as I was talking with the woman from a previous episode, she did not learn to sew with patterns. She learned to sew with with measurements. Yeah. So I thought that it really it gives you a different set of skills. Yeah. And I thought it gave you even a bit more confidence. Like similarly, you're ex as you were explaining that a lot mm -hmm. of the European patterns do not have seam allowances, which allows you to make adjustments to the pattern before you add those. Yeah. And, and it just gives you a whole different set of skills than what we are, what we get here. You do have the pattern magazines, the, the Burda, and you have a few French pattern magazines. 
mm-hmm. the American patterns, then you have to really go to a yeah like a fabric store. You can get them there, but the what I see see what you have so many choices. No, that, that I yes, didn't. it's interesting. Sorry, <laughs> it's inter- it, It's okay. It's interesting to me because. What I'm realizing after talking to so many sewists from around the world and different places is that at least here in the U.S., with us being, at least I can't speak for everyone, for myself, Mm -hmm. as someone who learned to sew with a bunch of patterns, the big four pattern company, and now um, more independent companies, which have the benefit of reaching an international audience with Mm -hmm. the PDFs. That's one another great thing about PDFs. Mm -hmm. I feel as though... I. It encourages a type of dependency, at least for me. I have, I don't know, I might have 700 commercial patterns in my house right Right. now. I'm pretty sure I do. I'm pretty sure. I think 700 is probably a low estimate because I can buy them when they're a dollar or two dollars or now the sale might be four dollars or three dollars so they are they're they're plentiful they're widely available they're not that expensive Mm -hmm. if I want two sizes of a pattern I'll just buy two patterns at the three dollar or two dollar sale but which but what I get in convenience though I feel like I've lost in certain essential skills oh yeah I I can understand right Yeah. So like, you know how to do adjustments and measurement, you you know how to do adjustments, you know how to make these changes, how to get things to fit on your body. I tend to just buy the pattern size that I think is going to fit the best. And then I might tweak it a little bit, but there's a lot that I don't know how to do because I never really had to learn it. And so that's one of the things I appreciate about learning the way that people sew around the world, Mm -hmm. because everyone is getting a different we're all doing the same thing, but, but we're just doing yeah. it in a di- yeah yeah in a different way mm-hmm. yeah yeah. And I was raised with the idea that I always have to adjust the pattern. So even though I buy a pattern, I always have to adjust make adjustments to make it fit better. Yeah. So I never use a pattern straight out of the envelope. I always make some adjustments and check the pattern to fit my size that and that's the smart way that's the smart way to do it it's I think it's such a a good way I've started to be a little bit better about that and I think it helps me also to tell a different story Mm -hmm. I think that's something that one of the things that I learned from you Vanessa is based on what you learned if you started sewing and I always have to adjust the pattern you don't have an emotional attachment to that at least maybe you do, I don't know. But for me, I, if someone like me who was trained to say, okay, just buy the pattern and sew the pattern and the pattern will fit or not fit, that very limited training or that very limited approach to pattern wearing or pattern sewing, it it can say, it can at least it can wear on you. I yeah, think it can wear yeah, on some people's yeah. like self-esteem or self-image if they feel like, Instead of the pattern being broken or the pattern being limited, you turn this against your own body. And that, I think, is one of the most very tragic and sad thing when people are sewing in such a way that says, oh, no, the pattern is correct. I need to make sure that I squeeze myself into these things that really aren't meant to fit me. And so I think having the skills of adjustment really make a big difference there. They really do. I wanted to pivot a bit and talk a bit in about your approach or your thoughts on African print fabrics. I know we've talked about this a little bit before, mm-hmm. but I'm really interested in that story. And I know, I'm not sure if, if, if how many folks know the story of how, like when you see, if you buy some African fabrics, it'll say Dutch wax prints on the side, or it'll say Holland is often marked on the sides of these fabrics. Right. Some of the major companies that are in this industry have been in the industry for hundreds of years. Is it, has it been that long? Uh, 175 years. 175 mm-hmm. years. And then so, I'm talking about Flisco. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yes, and so these folks are known as like the superstars of mm-hmm. African print fabrics, and it's a Dutch company. It's based in the Netherlands. And it's interesting because it seems like the story of the Dutch involvement in African print fabrics 
aren't is it I don't know how well known it is. I I know about it, but I don't know how well known it is more broadly. So can you tell us a little bit about the as a Dutch woman, I think you have this great attachment to the history. So can you talk a bit about the history of the Dutch involvement in African fabrics, like where that all started and came from? Yeah, sure. So the company started in um, 1846, and it's called Flisco, and it's based here in Helmond, and it's about an hour and a half away from my house. And they started with making imitation batik fabric, and batik is the tradition of making uh, wax-resistant dyed fabric. And they do that in uh, Indonesia 170 years ago. It was not called Indonesia. It was the Dutch East Indies. It was colonized mm. by the Dutch. And that's sometimes mm-hmm, a detail mm-hmm. people forget when they tell the story about the Dutch going to Indonesia. The Dutch were really good in, in imitating the batik, but they were not as good as the uh, and they, it's like, why do we want to buy this from you? We yeah. are Indonesian yeah. and we we have our own ancestral exactly. practices of making this fabric. So why would we want to buy that from but you? But the Dutch made it uh, cheaper. That's true, but not better. And also they protected their market against imitation and fabrics coming from outside. So that's why they didn't really kick, uh, they didn't start in that industry that much. So then they were looking for a different market. And around the same time, there's the legend of the Balanda Hitam. And those were around 3,000 3, mostly Ghanaian recruits recruited by the Dutch to fight in the colonial army in Indonesia. And those hmm. Ghanaian men, when they went back to West Africa, they took with them a batik fabric. And that was uh, around the same time that Flisco started to sell also batik in the West Africa. So that's... Oh, so the Ghanaian soldiers who were there as part of the colonial army to help support the Dutch in the East Indies, when they returned home to Ghana, they brought some of the fabric with them? Or did they... Did they bring the fabric with them or did they just say, listen, this is what we saw? They, they, so so they essentially brought, the, brought fabric with them when mm-hmm. they uh, returned. And the story goes, that's how the uh, Dutch got the idea to sell their batiks because they saw that it was getting popular by these soldiers. And to be honest, we still don't know if they were enslaved or like free soldiers or free uh, right yeah. so right that's a little bit uh, a strange history or not strange history it's they're trying to figure out what actually happened there mhm but with in either case this was it's an interesting story about global expansion mm-hmm. and and imperialism slash colonialism yeah. and like using African soldiers to help the Dutch keep their colonial control of Indonesia or what they what they call the the Dutch East Indies. Yeah. So it, these different connections and these different relationships mm-hmm. which are which we might understand in one way on a global political scale mm-hmm. or a geopolitical scale actually also influence fabric exactly. and the fabric that we buy which is such an such an interesting story. So you're, so now, so what's going on today? Is there a long, has, I know, I'm sure a lot happens, of course, over 175 years, but what's, what do you, what is, what are your opinions or thoughts on what's going on today? Today, the company is here in the Netherlands. They have around 500 uh, uh, employees, mostly Dutch. Uh, Their design team is Dutch, white Dutch. And in West Africa, they have around 2,000 employees. And the Flisco Group, that's the parent company. Under them, they have uh, a couple of other companies, GTP, uh, Uniwax, and Wooding. And those are uh, companies that are Ghanaian and in the Ivory Coast. So they do produce for those brands in the West Africa. The thing that I find most interesting and also sad is that they made 3,500 prints over the 170 years. 
but the property of those prints are with Flisco. And that makes it a little mm. bit confusing <laughs> because we a lot of times we don't talk about uh, property and with property, intellectual property. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So some of the prints that are over the years, first they started with batik and the sort of the prints looked, the design looked really Indonesian. And then, so, mm-hmm. then over the years, they started to produce prints that are specific for certain markets. And mm-hmm. we feel like it's a really cultural fabric. And it is. Yes. But it's still protected on the copyright law and Dutch copyright law. So that means that if you have something cultural, if they the company wants to use it for something else, yeah, where do you have anything to say in that? That is so interesting. I like your phrase when you said, we feel like it's cultural fabric, but it's owned by the Dutch. Like uh, the images, the intellectual property of the art that's used in the manufacturing is not is the company property. That is yeah. so interesting. And how many prints did you say they have? 3,500? They did over the, yeah, over the years, 3,500. Not all are still in property. So after a while, some can yeah. be public. Tea. Public domain. Yeah, public domain. Yes. But uh, yeah, the majority of those are, of course, under, uh, and now you see a lot of collaborations they had uh, with Adidas, Stella McCartney, uh, Dior recently. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So sometimes we are talking about the cultural, from a cultural perspective, if Stella McCartney has uh, certain prints on the wrong way, Mm -hmm. people feel a certain way about it, but what can we do if it's not our property? So what do you think the solutions are? Do you feel that the solutions are for more Black folks to start designing, to start um, developing relationships with manufacturers? Mm -hmm. What do you think the solution is for the problem you've identified? Protecting what the cultural fabrics that we have, because there there are still in, in Africa so many different techniques and prints and symbols and prints that we should try to protect Mm -hmm. and next to that there are still uh, companies and small businesses that print their own fabric in west africa and uh, across the continent actually which you can find if it's uh, yes flisco it will say the name flisco and i think it's important for us also to use the name flisco so that you can identify where it comes from because the Dutch wax, Hollandaise wax, they say authentic wax print, or those are also all trademarked terms. Oh, that's interesting. By that I did not realize that Dutch wax is a trademark of Velisco. Yeah, some of these. Which makes sense. Yeah. That does make sense. Yeah. Now, every there's a, a lot of Chinese companies started 20 years ago, started to produce also these wax prints mm-hmm. but those are all like trademark terms or authentic and uh, genuine they use and all yes. these things and if we use those terms it's uh you don't know where it comes from anymore it's, yeah. it's it does make it said it makes it what you said it makes it difficult yeah because if there's something wrong who do you go to you only know the trademark you don't know the company and so but there's so many of these different fabrics with different like marks on the yeah, salvage yeah. and it might say Vlisco or it might say authentic yeah. Dutch wax it might mm-hmm. but it might not be Vlisco no. but the idea of having Vlisco as well being the only person you're supposed to get wax fabric from seems also very problematic yeah, that's so, so that's a problem yeah. So it's just, it's very interesting to it's, think about all of these issues all being tied up together. But also you know? for new designers, it's important to think about uh, intellectual property when they start the, the producing fabric and making sure you get your po- uh, copyright uh, issues that you know for which con- for your country, how that works and what you can do to protect mm-hmm. your own things. Yes, because yes, the, that makes sense. The, where this whole story started with the Indonesian batik. The Indonesian batik is now under the UNESCO 
So it's seen as an... Yes, yeah. that's interesting. So Indonesian batik is protected by UNESCO. Yeah. That is interesting. <laughs> Oh, that is so like that. So that is the the UNESCO designation. So UNESCO, y'all, they designate world heritage sites. Mm -hmm. They look out for and identify different cultural properties around the world. They they designate buildings and all this kind of things as being things of great cultural importance, as well as having significance around the world. So, for example, the Taj Mahal is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I actually work at a World Heritage Site, the oh, University really? of Virginia. Nice. Yeah, the University of Virginia and Monticello are listed as UNESCO mm-hmm. World Heritage Sites. So the idea that Indonesian batik fabric is now listed as as basically a kind of a protected cultural property or a recognized cultural yeah. property yeah. Um, is significant. And it just as an example is that what you were saying for like when new designers come up and they're creating fabrics and mm-hmm. prints, it becomes useful for them to think about what it means to put boundaries around what you've created. Yeah. And what the rules are for your country where you create it, because yeah, intellectual property law is not international. So you don't know the rules are, can be different for each country, but it's important to, and also in the sewing in uh, community, I see a lot of people taking prints and then by themselves putting a, a, a wax print on a, stretch fabric not mm. knowing that's a copyright infringement basically because oh that's interesting because these images are owned by somebody yeah. else and so if you're going to start manufacturing something you can't manufacture no. something that comes from someone else no. <laughs> <laughs> but i see it a lot that i see oh someone is uh, now selling stretch but then it's a complete uh, a copy of the uh, of an print uh, but then yeah you cannot do that of course Oh, that's so it's it's so interesting. It's, and, and that's why it becomes important to have artists and designers that are mm-hmm. aware of what other people are doing, not so they can copy it, but so they can not copy yeah. it. <laughs> so they can, so they can protect avoid your own and not copy others. <laughs> exactly. Protect your own and not copy yeah. others. Exactly. Let me ask you before we wrap up, what is next for you, Vanessa? And what's next for Cosido Studios? Oh, can you tell me what Cosido means? Is that a Dutch word? No, or is it's that into word. That's from the island of Curacao, where my mother is from. And it means actually sewist or a dressmaker, <gasps> or, yeah, it's anyone that sews. Cosido. Yeah. I really like that. Mm-hmm. And so it's from the, it's from the native Curacao language. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that is so cute. I'm so glad I asked mm-hmm. that question. That was a good question. I should have asked that earlier. But what's next for you, Vanessa, in Cosido Studios? Yeah, I'm working on new designs. I'm working on some new dresses, skirts that are working for new solutions for our booties, uh, making patterns for our booties. And uh, yeah, I'm also continue with uh, illustrating. And I'm trying to also put some illustrations on fabrics. Oh, that'll be fun. Yeah. So yeah, that's what I'm working on now. That sounds great. That sounds really good. So that you'll have some more companion pieces yeah. to the current patterns you have out. That's fantastic. So tell us where we can find you on social media. I'll be sure to include the links in the show notes. But where can people find you if they want to find you out in the world of the Internet? It's at uh, Cosido Studio Everywhere, actually. Oh, excellent. (laughs) So we can find you there on Instagram and you have a Facebook group um, and your website. Okay. So you all, we've been talking today with Vanessa from Cosido Studio and Cosido means sewist or sewing in the native Curacao language. So that's really beautiful. Thanks for teaching us that. (laughs) Vanessa, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate the time and us dealing with the time change of about, I think, six hours for us to have this conversation. So thank you so much for that. I, I had a really great time. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa.
You've been listening to the Stitch Please podcast, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. We appreciate you supporting us by listening to the podcast. If you'd like to reach out with, to us with questions, you can contact us at blackwomenstitch at gmail.com. If you'd like to support us financially, you can do that by supporting us on Patreon, P A T R E O N. And you can find Black Women Stitch there in the Patreon directory. And for as little as $2 a month, you can help support the project with things like editing, transcripts, and other things to strengthen the podcast. And finally, if financial support is not something you can do right now, you can really help the podcast by rating it and reviewing it anywhere you listen to podcasts that allows you to review them. So I know that not all podcasts Um, directories or services allow for reviews but for those who do for those that have a star rating or just ask for a few comments if you could share those comments and say nice things about us at the stitch please podcast that is incredibly helpful thank you so much come back next week and we'll help you get your stitch together